All right. So while while we're getting everybody muted, uh, the there will be a time for questions. There's two ways you can do questions. I am going to be following the uh, feed on the um, the channel for this, so you can type questions into the feed. But then uh, also at the end, we'll do some questions. We'll turn everybody's mics back on and try to do some questions. So uh, my name is Jean Shi. Uh, in, in human circles, I go by Jeremy. Uh, and I joined the Klingon Language Institute in 1992. So what does that make that? 28 years ago. 28 years I've been screwing around with this. Um, there are better language. There are people who speak the language better than me. They put a lot of time and effort into it. But in 28 years, I've learned a thing or two. So I'm going to share some of that with you tonight. Um, the I thought I would just introduce myself first. I've actually sort of got, it's not really a slide presentation, but it's like a slide presentation that we're going to go through. It's a Google Docs file. So at the end of the thing, I'll give you guys a link to the Google Docs file. And you can always go back and check it out. Um, print it up, make some notes as soon as you can remember them. Uh, but let me let me switch over to the Google Docs file and we'll we'll work from there. Uh, what do I need to do? Good. So here's my presentation to you guys. We're going to talk about Mukadvesh, but we'll get to that in a minute. Let me go over just a few general language things first. Put some links at the top of this page. And like I said, I will give you a link to this Google Doc later. But uh, there's a link for the Klingon Language Institute, a link for Chol Ampash, which is the language school of CAG. And you can look up words on there. You can look up grammar on there. There's a lot of good things on there. You can even type in Klingon in Latin letters and it can give you Picard, an image with the Picard. There's also a, um, you can type in a sentence and have it read the sentence to you. Uh, with both of those features, you need to enter your sentence correctly. Don't leave out any apostrophes. Uh, then the next one is the Duolingo Klingon course. Some of you are probably doing the Duolingo Klingon course. I am one of the contributors and at the moment, the head of the team the Duolingo Klingon course. So uh, I, I will take questions about that at the end if you guys want to ask any questions about that. And then there's the Facebook group. There is a Facebook group where you can ask questions and try out your Klingon, say a few things. There's also a Klingon Language Institute Discord channel. If you go to the Klingon Language Institute, you can find that in all the various menu items they have. The next item on our list here is Bookwit, which is an app available for Android and Apple. Bookwit is an excellent program for looking up definitions and looking up grammar. It, uh, Chol Ampash and Bookwit have very similar features. They're designed a little different, but they're both excellent resources. Um, the, if you, Bookwit is nice because you can just sort of carry it with you. And Cholam Pash is great when you're on your computer. Then I wanted to mention the books. I'm going to show you these books at the end, but there's three books that Dr. Okrand has, three paper books that Dr. Okrand has written. Klingon Dictionary. This is an essential guide that every student of the language needs. It is your main reference and resource. For many of us that joined the community 28 years ago, it was the only resource and it was what we used to teach ourselves Klingon. The first half of it describes the grammar in detail. Uh, these days we have some nice features like Duolingo. And if you go to the Klingon Language Institute, there's an online course there. So we have methods that may be a little better, but the Klingon dictionary is still your essential reference. That's where the rules are written down. Uh, Klingon for the Galactic Traveler is more of a cultural book. It's a great read, even if you never intend to use any of the language, you'll enjoy the book, but it has a lot of language details and a lot of new vocabulary in it. And then there's the Klingon Way, which is uh, Proverbs, and it gives each proverb in Klingon as well as a description of the proverb, maybe a little talk about the language, some things like that. So the Klingon way is a great way both to test your ability to read 
Klingon, see what good Klingon sentences look like, and memorize some nice proverbs that you can throw at people. Then there's actually two more books by Dr. Okren, Conversational Klingon and Power Klingon. These are audio books. They are excellent. You can hear the guy who created the language speaking the language. It's great for hearing how he intended it to sound. And they're also very fun. The third one there is Crossed Out, The Klingon Way. This is the same as the book. And the Klingon in both of the other audiobooks is spoken by Dr. Okren. The Klingon in the audiobook of The Klingon Way is spoken by Michael Dorn and Roxanne Dawson, who don't do a great job. Michael Dorn doesn't even put any effort into it. Roxanne, Roxanne Dawson is working hard at it, but didn't really have any training in how to speak it. And so her audio comes off not great. I would not suggest the Klingon Way audiobook. That's why it's crossed out. The other two audiobooks are great, and the Klingon Way paperback book is amazing. All right, so this is what we're going to cover today in our Klingon Curse Warfare. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about greetings. That's not curse warfare, but it makes me want to curse at people. So we will learn a little greetings. We're going to go over that and make sure you guys know your greetings. Then there's general invectives. General invectives are uh, swear words you say about the situation. They're not name calling. The next item will be epithets, which is name calling. Uh, the general invectives are what you yell out when you hit your thumb with a hammer and things like that. Uh, okay, and then we have the epithets, which is a name call, and we'll go over that a little bit. And uh, then we'll also do some longer curses. The word curse originally meant that you're wishing for misfortune on somebody. Now we use it just to mean, uh, uh, just for complicated insults that are more than just a name call are uh, saying something about someone. We'll have some good classic curses at the end of this. And then we'll talk about grammar a little bit for those of you guys who uh, are willing to put up with that. Um, like the greetings make me swear, the grammar is gonna make you swear. But uh, it's, it's worth going over a little bit. So we'll see if we can cover that in the time we have. And then uh, when it gets to the hour mark, wherever I am, I'm gonna stop and we'll take questions and we'll see what's going on. I saw that people are saying my screen is cutting out a little bit. I'm sorry about that. We'll see if we can uh, work better. And uh, most of it's going to be static, though. So if you get it for a little while and lose it for a little while, it'll be OK. And let's talk about the greetings. The first thing I have here is just someone's name. And the reason for that is I wanted to point out that Klingons do it differently than humans. In, in English, we say Captain Krug, but in Klingon, we say Krug Chod. And let's do a little pronunciation practice. I'm going to ask all of you guys at home to practice saying this. I'm not going to be able to hear you and give you feedback, but if you have questions about it at the end or want to put questions in the, uh, the feed, that's okay. You can put questions in the feed. Uh, so that capital Q, there's actually two Qs in Klingon. There's a small Q and a capital Q. The capital Q is a difficult sound. It's not one we have in English. Basically, you close your throat and then explode a cough, maybe you could call it, or clearing your throat or something like that. It sounds like this. <coughs> like a cat with a hairball. <coughs> E-H is a little bit of a growl or a purr. Is all got that? Let's move on to the next one. This is the famous Nuknech. I give you that. That raspy H sound. Nuknech. I want to point out this does not mean hello. Do not enter a forum and say nuknech. Do not walk up to a group and say nuknech. Nuknech means what do you. So if someone walks up to you, just stands there looking at you, you say nuknech. 
All right, let's, uh, uh, I'm gonna give you guys a moment all to practice saying that because I want that good. <laughs> all right, are they saying, all right. Uh, so let's move on to the next one. The next thing you, so uh, we have what do you want? But we don't have a way to say hello. And humans love to have the word hello. Some sort of a greeting to announce yourself. Plus on online forums, it can sometimes be polite that people know you're there. I've given you here four possible greetings you can use when you're talking to humans and you know they want to hear something or when you uh, want to uh, announce that you're in a forum. The first one is Jipao Pu. I have arrived. Jipao Pu. All of these letters are letters we say in English. The only problem is that glottal stop on the end. Don't say Jipao Pu. Cut that sound off at the end. That little apostrophe tells you that you have to cut it off hard. Jipao Pu. Everybody try saying that. One is Jishach. Jishach means I am here. We have that H again, which is capitalized to remind us, make it a raspy H. And we have an S, which is capitalized to tell us it's different than the English S. It may sound to you a little like I'm making an SH sound. I've actually moved my tongue up to the roof of my mouth. You got to pull the tip of your tongue back that it's way up high in the roof of your mouth. It may sound a little like an SH, but try to say an S up there. You may want to move back from your computer screen if you don't have any wipes handy. Jishach. I'm going to point out too that I is capitalized. Notice in Jipaupu and Jishach, the I in Klingon is capitalized. And the reason for that is it, people who have studied other languages may want to say the I as E. This is not G Pao Pu or G Shach. Uh, it's J Pao Pu, J Shach. And so that I is capitalized to remind you that you've got to do that I, the I that says E. All right, let's look at these other two. Kavan. Kavan means I salute you, but you can only say it to one person. It may not be good for forums because you're trying to tell multiple people that you are saluting them. So when it's multiple people, you say Shavan. Make sure to put that S up in the roof of your mouth. Shavan. Well, I rushed through these three. Let's go back and have everybody say Jeshach. Jeshach. All right, now let's have everybody say Kavan. 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 Last of those four announcing that you're here. Shavan. 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 All right, and then we have Kaplat. You guys all know this word. You guys have all heard it, though I'm guessing a fair few of you don't know how to spell it. So look carefully at the spelling here. Capital Q at the beginning, and the apostrophe goes at the very end. Do not put the apostrophe after the Q. Do not put the apostrophe after the first A. It is misspelled if the apostrophe is in the wrong place. Remember that the apostrophe cuts off the sound at the end. So do not say kapla. Say kapla. All right, now you guys all know how to say it. Practice it. Kapla. And I guess that you guys all had success. So kapla. Remember that Q needs to be that hard Q too. And I want to make one more point. Be careful not to say kapla. The P goes with the kap. Kapla. All right, and I got one more phrase for you here in greetings, and then we'll move on to curse warfare. Mukadve. Last one is another sentence you guys all know. The Klingon's a little complicated, so I don't know how many of you have memorized it. But once I share this file with you, I want you all to memorize it and say it correctly. This has got some tough letters in it, so you will need to practice it a lot. Start again with that H. Then there's the G-H. 
Those are actually the same sound, but the GH you hum while you do it. Remember to cut off that U. And then we have that's that capital Q. Your throat is going to hurt after practicing this sentence. Expect it. Enjoy it. You can't have success without pain. Last word winds up being simple by comparison. Gajvam. Gajvam. When you're practicing it, take it slow. Go ahead and enjoy each sound in it as you say it. Listen to me say it real slow, and then you repeat it at the same speed. Gajvam. All right, let's get into some real mukkadvesh. Here's the general invectives. These are things you may yell out if you hit your thumb with a hammer or if the ensign tells you he forgot to arm the torpedo. So these are words like rui cha. Again, we have those apostrophes cutting off the sounds. So rui cha. Rui cha. I have translated that with symbols, like you'll see sometimes in the old cartoons and comics. Uh, let me say something here about all the Klingon swear words. People will ask me all the time, yeah, but what does that mean? I want you to think of your favorite English swear word. Let me ask you something. What does that mean? Probably came up with a meaning. It probably has a meaning. Now, let me ask you something. When you say that to someone or when you say that in a situation, do you actually mean that meaning? If I say the word damn, am I actually meaning to hell? I don't usually mean that when I say damn. So in a similar way, I'm not going to give you definitions on any of these Klingon swear words because whatever old meaning they may have once had, they now mean the symbols that you're seeing on your screen there. They simply express displeasure, shall we say. So let's say that one more time. What we say to Dr. Okren for not giving us meanings on these swear words. Again, oh, you're going to love that capital Q by the end of this whole thing. Remember to say it deep in your throat. Gasp out, explode out. Cut off that I, but remember it's I. Don't say yach. Say yach. We'll give you another one here. And slow, enjoy those sounds. Those are such great Klingon sounds. All right, how about another one? This is my favorite. And personally, I feel like this is the strongest of them. Others may disagree. Really sounds to me like you are very displeased. So say that Q, a nice strong Q, but then cut off that U. And then we have at the end that T-L-H sound. This is probably the most difficult sound for everyone to say. I'm going to go over my instructions for it a couple times. But basically, it's similar to a T and similar to an L, but not really the same as either. I want everybody to do this. Say a T. Keep saying the T while you're listening to me. Say a T over and over. Do you notice that to start the T, you close your tongue on the roof of your mouth? And then you explode out the tip of your tongue. You close the tongue on the roof, build up a little pressure and explode out the tip. This time for this sound, you're still going to close your tongue and build up that pressure, but you're going to try to explode out the sides of your tongue into your cheeks. (coughs) 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 (coughs)
it is very difficult for get a to get a tongue which has never made that motion to get that sound. Oh, that's the shape you want to end with. That's an L shape with the sound coming out the sides of your tongue and the tip of your tongue still on the roof of your mouth. Oh. You have to keep the tip of your tongue behind your teeth on the roof of your mouth for the entire sound. Now, a lot of tongues don't like that. They've never done that. They don't want to do that. So I have a trick if you're having trouble with that. The trick makes it not quite sound correct, but allows you to at least make the sound. And the trick is bite the tip of your tongue a little bit. Rather than putting it on the ridge behind your teeth, put it between your teeth and hold it there with your teeth. You don't have to draw blood if you don't want to, but you're welcome to if you do want to. So hold the tip of your tongue between your teeth and try it. You will eventually want to move that tongue back to the ridge behind your teeth, but that's a great way to train your tongue not to move. And again, you may want to back up from your screen while you're making this sound. In fact, this whole word, Everybody try it. We'll have more of those and we'll practice it some more. All right, the next one is va. Va is actually considered to be a shortened version of kuvat, but it seems to me so different. To me, va seems so casual. Va, I really probably would translate as like, damn, va. There's no glottal stop there, so hold that A a bit. Va. Remember, purr or growl, that G-H. It's similar to but this is the A still makes an ah sound, and the Y winds up making an E sound. Rai, 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 cha. And you're, you're pronouncing terrible. Now swear. Rai, cha. Okay. <laughs> the last one I have here on the general invectives is the word jait. Jait is not said alone. Jait is said as part of a sentence. Jait is added to the end of a sentence. The best explanation I can give for jait is it turns whatever sentence you just said into a sentence that Samuel L. Jackson has just said. There's no better explanation for it than that. Okay, let's look at some epithets. We'll run through these. Most of these don't have a definition, though there's some interesting things going on here. So we can uh, talk a little bit about these interesting things we're seeing there. Let's look at the first one. The first one is yintar. Remember that I is I. Don't say yintar. Say yintar. Yintar. Everybody say it. Yintar is also the word for life support system. I have no idea why life support system is a, is a name you might call someone in Klingon. Maybe you're accusing them of being as worthless as a life support system or as relying on the life support system. I'm not sure, but it must be bad to have someone call you Yintar. And the next one we have is Tordshach. Tordshach. Tordshach, also, we have no clear idea what it means, but the word Tord can mean rescue, and the word Shach can mean to care about something. So it may be that once upon a time, this was used as two separate words and meant. You are someone who likes to be rescued. Tordshach. Tordshach. Let's all say it. 
that D and that S both need to happen. Oh, we haven't had the D before. The capital D is there to remind you to also move your tongue up to the very top of your mouth. Move the tip of your tongue to the top of your mouth. In English, we say a D with the tip of our tongue at the front of our mouth. Klingons say it with the tip of their tongue up in the roof of their mouth. Da, da, da. Tod, shach. Now, getting that D in the roof of your mouth, the tongue has to come off, and then it has to go back up to get the S. It's a little tongue gymnastics. If you use your tongue for anything, it will appreciate this exercise. Tod, shach. Just say it slow and do them separately for the moment. You can speed up later. Everybody say it one more time. Tord shach. All right, you guys are doing great. We're moving along. This next one sounds nasty. I have no idea what it means, but it really sounds bad. Kov pot. There we have that TLH again. Remember, hold the tip of your tongue at the front of your mouth, either against the roof of your mouth or between your teeth, and then make all the air explode out the sides of your tongue into your cheeks. Kov pot. Kov pot. Say it again. All right, we're going to do a few words now where we actually do have definitions. The word koch specifically means fool. Koch. And the only complication here is that big capital H. Make sure to rasp that out in your throat. Koch. All right. We're doing great here. You guys are learning some great curse warfare. The next one is nooch. Nooch only contains sounds that we also have in English. Not even the, the worst human should have any problem saying nooch. And that really applies because most humans are nooch. That means coward. Nooch. They're also mostly pujwit. There's a few humans that maybe are not pujwit. But the main thing here is remember say wit, not we. This is not we. And come to think of it, the U is not pu. It's not pudge we. It's pujwit. Pujwit. Say it. Very good. The next one is Yech Puklod. Yech Puklod. That means son of a tribble. This needs no explanation. Make sure to do the H with a nice raspy H and the D with the tip of your tongue up at the roof of your mouth. Yech Puklod. All right, we got two more epithets, and then we'll move on to some real curse warfare. The next epithet, you guys all know, you've heard it. Even Captain Picard knows this epithet. Etak. Captain Picard does not do a good cue on the end. Captain Picard is a petak. Do a good cue on the end. Explode it out of your throat. Make them feel your cue, not just hear it. Petak. Petak. Epithet. This epithet is Tach Kek. Tach Kek. This is another one. We're not officially given a meaning, and we can't be certain of the derivation of it, but tach means to go on, to happen endlessly, to keep going on, like tach jaj klingon, tach jaj o. Oh. May the empire go on. May the empire continue. Tach jaj. But this is not tach jaj. Tach. Word kek mean to practice something, to drill, to do it over and over again, to learn it. Now, my theory is the origin of tach kek is someone who never perfects his skills. He just goes on practicing forever and ever. He is a tach.
You've got some invectives. You've got some epithets. And for those of you who weren't here at the beginning, I'm going to post this whole document in the stream when we're done with this. So you will be able to go back over this later, make some notes on it for yourself, and uh, practice at home. Okay, Mukadvesh, good Klingon curses. You know what? Let's learn how to say Mukadvesh. I didn't teach you how to say that. Remember that D goes up in the roof of your mouth, that S goes up in the roof of your mouth, and the apostrophe cuts off the sound. Mukadvesh. Mukadvesh. Our first Mukadvesh is Targlej Yingar Yeruch. Go mate with your targ. All right, so there's some difficult things here. We repeat some of these points I've been making. A GH is a growl or a purr from your throat. Tar. Tar. Tarlidge. And then in the next word, there's an NG together there. G never appears alone. It always appears either with an N or with an H. When the G is with an H, we get that purr. When a G is with an N, we it actually connects to the G, not to what's before it. Be careful not to say yin, ga. The N and the G go together. This is a sound that we make in English at the end of words like king, ring, sing. But in Klingon, you got to learn how to say it at the beginning of a word. If we take the ye off, the ye is a prefix. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. But if we take the ye off, you're left with the word ngar, ngar. To make that ng sound, lift the back of your tongue up to the roof of your mouth. Put it actually on the roof of your mouth and make the sound from back there through your nose, but with the back of your tongue at the roof of your mouth. Ngar, ngar. So the word is yingar, yingar. And this curse is yeruch, yeruch. should be said at the front of the mouth with the tip of your tongue behind your teeth. You can either say it with a simple tap of your tongue, almost like a D, Yeruch. Or you can say it with a full roll if you want. Yeruch. Yeruch. Whatever you find easiest to do. But don't say it at the back of your mouth like in English are. Yeruch. Yeruch. Hey, guys, Yeruch. All right, let's say the whole phrase. Targlidj yingar Yeruch. With your targ. Let's do another one. Dej pukbog chov rur kablidj. Your face looks like a collapsed star. Dej pukbog chov rur kablidj. Most of these sounds are pretty easy. You've got that GH and that H that we need to practice. You've got that glottal stop, that cut off in the middle of the first word. And remember to start with your tongue in the roof of your mouth. Dej pukbog chov rur kablidj. Okay, our next one is Harlidge Ab Hin Lau No Le Hoch Yabdu Tin Push. This is our longest one of the night. If you can make it through this one, you're doing great. 
Take it one word at a time. In fact, take it one syllable at a time. But I want to point out one little thing. Here, I can actually do this. I am going to add a comma. Separate these two clauses. Oh no, adding the comma puts the push on the next line. I'm going to remove a comma. But where am I? If you can see my blinking cursor, or even my moving cursor, it separates two phrases. So go ahead when you're saying it and take a pause right there to say the two phrases separately. I'm going to say it one more time. Listen for that GH and that apostrophe cut off and that H that vibrates in the throat and that S that happens in the roof of the mouth. And when I'm done, go ahead and repeat it all. Targlij yab tin lau. No le choch yab du tin I said slow, but not that slow. Let's move on. You are a total waste of good energy. All right, what do we need to pay attention to? That H, there's two of them in here. Remember to give us a good a raspy H from deep in your throat. Remember the S and the D both need to happen up in the top of the roof of your mouth. Pull the tip of your tongue all the way up there in the very top. Say it. Next one is or dak lush pet och dak lidge et. Oh, there's some interesting things going on here. Two glottal stops in a row, two apostrophes, two interruptions of the sound. In actuality, you'll really only get one interruption of the sound. You can't interrupt the sound and then interrupt your interrupting of the sound. The reason this happens is, let's look a little later, the next apostrophe is for the word och. Och. People ask me sometimes, how do I pronounce a stop at the beginning of a word? I haven't said anything. What do you do? The secret is you just close your throat. And there's another secret too. All English words that start with a vowel actually start with a glottal stop. When you say the word apple, you are closing your throat before you say it. Pay attention and say it. Apple, apple. Your throat closes. I don't know if you can feel your glottis close before you say apple. So it's something we naturally do even when speaking English. So it's easy to do in Klingon when you say och, och. You don't have to make any effort. You will naturally start with the right sound. Och. Oh. Or dak. That glottal stop on or means you have to close the glottis before saying the o. But since you've closed it for re, it's easy to do. Re or dak. Lush pet och dak lij et. You belong in a black hole in the netherworld. I'm going to say it one more time for you all to repeat. Re or dak, lush pet och dak lij et. And for the last one on this page, this is the granddaddy of all insults. Do not say this early in Mukadvesh because there's nowhere to escalate from here. Chab toshli chuch. Your mother has a smooth forehead. 
make sure to give us a great cue on that. Make that cue come deep from within you. Make that cue spit out onto the person you are swearing at. Chab shoshlit chuch. Say it. More, and we got a little bit more time. So I'm going to move on to some more very special ones. Let me say first that the best mukhadvesh are the ones you create yourself. These are great ones to memorize. And if someone doesn't speak it but has listened to Power Klingon, they may even recognize some of these. But the best mukhadvesh is the ones that you create yourself. So once you get good at Klingon, you need to create your own. And then you can really participate in mukhadvesh. These ones I have here were not created by me, but I loved them so much, I brought them along. Kerr, our thought admiral, helped translate a Klingon Christmas carol. And these are some of the mukhadvesh that were created by characters in a Klingon Christmas carol. And I loved them so much, I wanted us to practice them here tonight. The first one is Chokhmoch Vulkangan Darur. You are as infuriating as a Vulcan. In that Vulkangan, it's not Vulkangan. That's that ng sound. Lift the back of your tongue to the roof of your mouth. Ngan, ngan. And then for the end, the tip of your tongue will lift to the roof of your roof of your mouth. So ngan, chokhmoch, vulkangan darur. Say it. Bang ve wiv ta git klingan ve pich pu. Verengan ve pich bet pu. Oh, is this the first time we've used the word klingan? It may be. Klingan in klingan is not spelled with a K. There are no Ks. It's not even spelled with a Q, which sounds a lot like a K. It actually is spelled with that TL sound, that sound made by holding the tip of your tongue at the front of your mouth, exploding the sound out the sides of your tongue into your cheeks. <laughs> Klingon, Klingon. And you can get away with making an E sound for that I. Oh no, the I is, yeah, no, that's right. You can get away with making an E sound for that I because the ng sort of pulls it into that sound, but you should really try to say i kle kle klingon klingon. Uh, and there we have that ng again ngan ngan. That's also in verengan ngan verengan. Hit all those glottal stops. Good. This is a tough one. I'm gonna make a point I should have made earlier. The most important part about Mukhadvesh is not correct pronunciation. As a Klingon teacher, I love correct pronunciation and I want correct pronunciation. But I have to admit, when I leave the classroom and participate in Mukhadvesh, the pronunciation becomes meaningless. The Klingonness, the effort, the manner of delivering your mukhadvesh is so much more important. I want you to try a little bit to say this well, but even more, I want you to try a lot to say this like a Klingon. I'm going to say it, and then you show me what a Klingon sounds like. Bang ve wiv ta dit Klingon ve pich pu ve rengan ve pich be Poo. 
short one to give us a little break after that long one. Move vip badge. I recommend saying both V's. A shuv vip edge. And remember to put that S up in the roof of your mouth. All of the rest of these letters are sounds that are in English. No one should have any problems. Be shuv vip edge. Say it. Full of liquid saliva. I was trying to clean it. Okay, the next sentence is Bat Jeshuv Bat Cha Beshak Tachvish. I will fight proudly while you whimper in disgrace. Bat Jeshuv Bat Cha. Beshak tach vish. Say it. One more piece of mukhag vish for you. This one comes with a little extra twist at the end. You have to do the sound and the motion with it. Listen to me and you'll hear what I mean. Ta me lij leg chov me chuv edge chov. Naked stars look upon your deeds and yawn. Ta me lij leg chov me chuv. Hope. You try. Very well. The uh, now I'm going to go quickly over the grammar. This is not intended to be a grammar lesson. There is way too much grammar to try to teach you. I want to hit some high points that may help you when you're using other sources like Duolingo or the Klingon Language Institute online course or the Klingon dictionary. The first point I want to make is sentences in Klingon look like they're in reverse. They're not actually in reverse. Klingon just puts things in a different order. There are parts of the Klingon sentence that are reversed and parts that aren't. But the main core of every sentence in Klingon is the verb. Sometimes you can have a Klingon, a whole Klingon sentence that is just the verb. And I'll talk about that in a moment. But when you do put a subject and object on them, they do go in the opposite order of how we do it in English. So for instance, if you take the sentence, the targ bites the Klingon, I spelled targ with the Klingon spelling. The targ bites the Klingon. In Klingon, that reverses into Klingon chop targ. Klingon chop targ. At first glance, an English speaker might think this means the Klingon bites the targ, but it doesn't. So don't get confused. It'll completely change the sentence. Klingon chop targ means the targ bites the Klingon. Next, we have a verb conjugation. Oh boy, if you've studied another language, you probably know about conjugation. English officially has conjugation, but it almost never actually conjugates. We say, I run, we run, they run. Um, the, only the only place we conjugate it differently is he runs, she runs, it runs. Uh, so if you haven't studied another language, you may not be so familiar with it. But if you've studied another language, have conjugated before. You know about changing the verb based on who is doing the action. So the first word I've got here, jichop, 
is I bite. I chop. I bite. Er ka chop. The, the big difference in Klingon and most languages that Earthlings would have studied, many Earth languages, most Earth languages, only conjugate for who is doing the action. They don't also change the verb based on who the action is done to. In Klingon, they actually change based on both who is doing the action and who the action is done to. Ha chop means... I bite you. Chop. I bite you. Klingon doesn't even use tenses, so it can mean I will bite you. It's a threat, or perhaps a promise, or perhaps even a come on. Ka chop. Ka chop. Let's see if I can get. I've got here a page that uh, went to sleep. <laughs> page of the Klingon prefixes. This may actually be the most difficult part of Klingon because there are so many prefixes. Fortunately, there's only like four that we use regularly, but eventually you'll want to memorize all of these. And it's a tough process, but the easy ones are that first column with no object. So I bite is j chop. You bite is b chop. We bite is ma chop. You bite is shu chop. Notice Klingon uses a different thing for one person when you're saying you and when you're saying you to multiple people. That's something English doesn't do either. So you got to get used to that when practice. J chop. And be careful. Don't do what I just did. Don't make it sound separate. J chop. A chop. A chop. Shu chop. Those zeros for he, she, and it or they actually mean no prefix gets added for that. So the word chop all alone means he bites or she bites or it bites or even they bite. Chop. It can take a little getting used to figuring out who is doing what, but oftentimes they'll make it clear if it's not already clear. Now let's see if I can get back to the screen I was at. Chop, a chop, and chop as an example of the j prefix, the ka prefix, and what we call the null prefix, the absence of a prefix. Then um, next I want to talk about to be or not to be. Not as in the thing from, uh, from uh, uh, Hamlet, although there's a great story. Theoretically, I only have seven minutes left. That doesn't include time to tell the story. But I don't believe there's anything happening after me. Someone message in the, the feed if I need to stop. But uh, the I'm going to tell the story about to be while we're all here for you guys to enjoy it. Some of you have probably, I know some of you have heard this. Others may have too, but some haven't. And it's a great story. When Dr. Okrand was writing out the rules for Klingon, he determined that there was no verb for to be. To be is a very essential verb in English, so it seems like that would be a bad thing to do. However, there are actually many Earth languages that don't have the verb to be. Uh, I've studied Hawaiian, and Hawaiian does not have the verb to be as an example. So uh, Dr. Okren decided to imitate some of those languages that do not have the verb to be, and there still to this day is no verb to be in Klingon. You notice I've tagged here after that that it's pronouns. There's a way you can use pronouns to act like the verb to be. So he cheated the system a little, but there's no actual verb to be. So of Star Trek VI, The Undiscovered Country. And they've told him they're going to ask him to translate some, uh, some Shakespeare into Klingon. Sounds like an interesting challenge to him. And they come up to him and they say, we're filming a scene tomorrow with Christopher Plummer. 
where we were thinking of having him say in English, to be or not to be. But we've decided to do it in Klingon. So how do you say to be or not to be in Klingon? Dr. Okren suddenly realized he had created a problem. Thought about it. He told him he'd have to think about it for a moment. And he finally came back to Christopher Plummer with the line, yin par yin bet. In Klingon, this means living or not living. Or I suppose you could translate it as to live or not to live. However, when he presented it to Christopher Plummer, Christopher Plummer said, Yin, Yin, Klingons don't say Yin. I'm not saying Yin. Give me a good Klingon word. That's not a direct quote, but it's good enough. So Dr. Okren went back to think a little more. Klingon had a suffix, tach. Tach means to go on, to continue. Oh, we've already seen the verb tach, to go on, to continue. Tach jaj wo. Tach jaj klingon mach. Uh, tach was originally not a verb. It was only a suffix that meant the same thing. And we'll talk about suffixes in just a minute. But Dr. Okren decided to promote the tach suffix to a verb. And tach became a verb that now gets used quite a bit by Klingons. So he went back to Christopher Plummer and said, okay, how about tach par tach bet? And that's how the line appears in the film. So, Klingon rach chod e. The captain is a Klingon. Remember, the order gets reversed. So, Klingon rach chod e becomes the captain is a Klingon. Rach does not mean is. Rach means he. But here, it's being used sort of like the verb is. So he is a Klingon. Klingon rach chod e. All right, so I mentioned suffixes. I said tach was originally a verb suffix. And uh, if you're going to study Klingon, you need to know about the Klingon suffixes. Here we have the, the word we've become familiar with here in this last page is chop. But there's a lot of other stuff on chop there. I told you about ka chop, but this sentence says ka chop kang lach bej. Let's everybody try to say that. Ka chop kang lach bej. Means I am, well, there's a, actually a couple ways this could be translated. Let's go with, I am willing to be able to bite you. I am willing, I'm going to type that here for you guys. Mm, da -da -da. You're not there. A syllable. Certainly willing to be able to bite you. One line, no. Ka chop kang lach bej. I am certainly willing to be able to. The, and then the next line says, Be chop er be pu mo. Be chop er be pu mo. You are not. Chop 
ech bepumo. Because you have not bit yourself. You can actually say these as one sentence in either order. Bichop ech bepumo. Kachop kang lach bej. Because you have not bit yourself, I am certainly willing to be able to bite you. Let's do this as. to those sentences if you can find a situation use them in let's everybody say them as one long sentence but let's say them in the order i have them there kachop kang lach bej bechop er bepumo I can get to another screen for a second here because I want to show you this is the pronouns that you can use like the verb to be you'll see down at the bottom it says pronoun used as to be that's not actually the page I wanted to show you right now is there are 10 suffix verb there are 10 verb suffix types and if I can get this centered, five noun suffix types. If you look over, there's a lot of suffixes in each type. Um, the important thing to know when you begin your studies in Klingon at any location is that verb suffixes can only go on verbs and noun suffixes can only go on nouns. But some of the suffixes look very, very much the same. If you look at the verb nine suffixes, near the right edge, you will see a suffix that is a, apostrophe, a, apostrophe. But if you look down at the noun suffixes in the type one, you will also see an apostrophe, a, apostrophe. These suffixes mean different things. And so you have to be careful whether you're reading a verb or a noun to figure out which suffix it is. You will also see if you look back up at the verb nine suffixes, you get wit, W-I apostrophe. But if you look down in the noun suffix, oh, he, it's not there. Someone needs to go and add that. I'll, maybe I'll go add it later. In the noun four suffixes, there's a suffix widge. There's another variation of it that is also wit and looks exactly like the wit suffix on verbs. Again, they mean different things. So you have to know if you're looking at a verb or a noun and don't try using the wrong one because it will change the meaning. The only one that's the same and means the same is mo. Again, we're looking at another type nine verb suffix. It's right in the middle of the list, mo, M-O apostrophe. And at the bottom of the noun suffix list, again, in the middle, we have mo. M O apostrophe. In both cases, it does mean because. So I suppose we could argue whether this is one suffix that can be used on both or two separate suffixes that look the same and mean the same. I don't know that it's an important argument. Okay, those are the suffixes. Um, I'm going to go back to my main screen, beginning of this whole thing for a second. Uh, yeah. So there's the web pages if you want the web pages. In just a moment, as soon as this is done, I'm going to put a link for this entire document that you'll be able to go and see later. But I want to be able to take questions, and I want to go to video to be able to take questions. So I'm going to hide this and go back to video. Hopefully I can do video. Is someone ready to force me into uh, the main uh, stage A if, if I fail to get in there on my own? Let's see what happens. Give me a second here. Meanwhile, I suppose we can so that they can talk to me and I can hear them. Oh, yeah, it's not letting me do video chat. Do I have to unshare first? No, there's too many people in the room, so we'll just have to do voice. Okay. Sounds good. Well, I'm in room one, so. Oh, they, like it won't let anybody share their video. 
look to be on video. I see. Right, because there's more than 25 people in here. Okay. Okay. Well, so uh, people people can just everybody should have like they should be able to unmute themselves and they can just use push to tour um, voice. They should just be able to do voice chat now. Okay, I'm actually going to go back to my document then and leave it up since you guys can't see me anyway. Does anybody have any questions? No questions. No, Crickets. you really explained that very well. And I had, I'm glad I had pictures next to me. You should have heard me. I was totally pronouncing it right after you. I have one. How do you say make me a cake? Make me a cake? Yes. Uh, so there's one small problem with that, and that is there's no word that clearly means cake. So uh, you, I can't promise you that people will immediately understand that you're talking about a cake. But uh, I'll type it out here for you. Enmoch means make a cake for me. Ichvad chab yichenmoch. Chab, by the way, chab doesn't mean just cake. Chab can be interpreted as pie or dumpling. There's actually a lot of uh, it's not clear how far you can stretch this thing in meaning, but definitely means pie or dumpling can be used for cake. You even use it for pizza. Ooh, I like that idea. Any other questions? Yeah, um, as somebody, so you, you've, you've taught Klingon to other people. Uh, what as as somebody who who teaches it, what do you find is most challenging about teach it teaching it? But what do you also find that is most like, uh, like the the easiest or the, the easiest part of teaching Klingon? Just kind of at both ends of the spectrum. Easiest part is that it's fun. <laughs> you get to have some fun when you're teaching Klingon, which is great. Harder to find on teaching Russian. Um, the uh. Let's see, what's the hardest part? I, th I think, so rather than the hardest part of teaching, I could probably come up with the hardest part of teaching. The hardest part of learning Klingon is getting used to the fact that things are in a different order. Teaching your brain to hear those things in that different order. In the Duolingo Klingon course, we have a lot of people who want, they're looking visually at the sentence almost 100% of the time. And so they have, they, it's easy to develop this habit of, I'm just going to read from the back of the sentence. And the problem is, when you start speaking Klingon, you can't ask people to say the sentence from the back of the sentence. The way to learn Klingon is not to read from the back of the sentence. Stop that, nip it in the bud. Don't let yourself do it at all. It's an easy trick to do. I, can't, I still catch myself sometimes looking to the end of the sentence to see what's going to be back there. Don't do it. Stop yourself. Learn to hear the words in Klingon order. Train your brain to interpret them in Klingon order. I will I will agree with you as somebody who has been doing the Duolingo course. Uh, that is 100% of the biggest thing that took me the longest was the figuring out the order, but also the like the je, the be, the pu at, at the ends and beginnings of words. Yeah, yeah. It, it, as far as pronunciation goes, there's a lot of, uh, you know, so much of like more than half of the sounds in Klingon are sounds that are in English. So really, it's not as tough as it seems, but those few sounds that are in Klingon that are not in English are real doozies. 
and so can really throw you trying to make that TLH and that capital Q and trying to remember to put the tip of your tongue in the roof of your mouth for duh and sh. It's, it's very, it's takes a lot of effort to learn to do those things naturally. Now, once you learn to do all those things naturally, then the only job is memorizing the vocabulary. Your brain eventually locks in on Klingon word order. And it's like, oh yeah, I got this. And your, your tongue eventually locks in on those sounds. It can do them without trouble. But, um, and then, and then memorizing in any language. So, but I wouldn't start with memorizing vocabulary, start by t working on training your brain to recognize Klingon word order and training your tongue to make those sounds. You're, you're asking, and basically what you're asking, it sounds like is like kind of try to think in Klingon. That's the goal. Don't expect it to happen no. for a long time. <laughs> no. Takes a lot of... Just like good uh, Klingon martial arts, can't step on the mat and expect to master it in a week. It's going to take years of your life to become a Dahar master. The Klingon vocabulary is actually easy. Even the computer can do it. <laughs> hey, I have a quick grammar question. Um... How do you say after? <laughs> Don't. <laughs> you got to figure out a different way to talk about things that happen in that order. Okay. Because I know in some tenseless languages, if you just have two things, if you say, um, I walked into the room, uh, I ate, it's interpreted as that one thing occurs after the other. So there's no need for that conjunction as Klingon similar. Yeah, uh, and you have to do things. Have to do things like that in okay. Klingon. Because um, I, I think it's so funny because we have suffixes for before, during, when, but then nothing to indicate an after. I keep hoping that's what I often do. Sorry, say again. You kind of use "de." At least that's how I often do it because it's it's after is is you're trying to imply a time sequence. So what you do is you say, you know, I, after I ate, I went to the store. You say, you know, when, when I ate, I went to the store or something like that. You know, you kind of shift it around. When I had I, the poo on there to sort of make it a little more clear. Right. Yeah. Right, right, yeah. And I, I completed prefix is to say that, you know, when I had finished eating, I went to the store. Hmm. Any more questions? Yeah, I had one about uh, syllables. Uh, yeah, I found it helpful. Like, there's this rule I read somewhere that no syllable is more than three characters or no less than two. But it helped me uh, kind of break up the letters and the words and find out where they start and end, you know? Yeah, so I'll talk about that a little bit. Typical, the standard, the most common Klingon syllable structure is just consonant, vowel, consonant. So uh, if we look up at the top, if you guys are still seeing my screen there, if you look up at the top, there's three syllables. Mu, ad, esh. Mu has three syllables, uh, three, um, three letters, three consonants. I'm sorry, three letters. <laughs> uh, M, U, glottal stop. Mu. And ka, so that's consonant, vowel, consonant. The next syllable has the same thing, consonant, vowel, consonant, card. And then the last word also, consonant, vowel, consonant, vesh. Um, and so that will be what you will see. I, I don't know. I haven't done a study of it, but I'm going to say 90% of the time, syllables have that structure, consonant, vowel, consonant. Um, it actually can be very helpful for things like on Facebook and in Duolingo, they use fonts that make it very difficult to distinguish between the lowercase l that Klingon uses and the uppercase i that Klingon uses. And a lot of the Duolingo students get confused by that. Hopefully, most of them figure it out before they quit. Um, we're trying to work on some ways to improve the Duolingo course to make that clearer. But um, the 
So, but you can use this syllable structure to guess whether it's an L or an I because, because if it's the first or third letter in the syllable, it's an L. And if it's that middle character in the syllable, then it's an I. I want to point out a couple other things about it. Um, let's look down here at this sentence I wrote down at the bottom that was requested. Make a cake for me. Jich uh, has that consonant vowel consonant. Vad has that consonant vowel consonant. Chab also has that consonant vowel consonant. But here it looks like it's four letters. What's happening here is that the CH is one consonant. And when you write in Picard, one symbol is used to represent that CH. But because in English we write it with two letters, it looks like two letters here. So it looks like you got consonant, consonant, vowel, consonant. In actuality, it's still consonant, vowel, consonant. Also, let's look at the last word, yichinmoch. Yi is a prefix. All of the prefixes are only consonant vowel. So this is an instance where it's not consonant vowel consonant. It's just consonant vowel. Ye. But then chen is again that consonant vowel consonant. Chen. That's that ch double letter consonant. Consonant vowel consonant. And then moch. Consonant vowel consonant. There are three exceptions to the uh, rule that all, uh, so so we have CVC, consonant, vowel, consonant, and we have CV, which is mostly used for prefixes, but there are some roots that are just CV. The verb da, to act or behave in a particular manner, da. Um, the word for um, torso is ro, uh, just R-O. Um, so there are CV consonants. And then we have a few interesting outliers. We have the RGH. It appears in a word like arg. RGH is, the, is one of the few consonant clusters in Klingon. Um, it's the only clear definite consonant cluster, but I'm going to talk about two more sort of consonant clusters. But uh, you will see RGH at the end of a syllable sometimes. Other ones are C V W apostrophe and C V Y apostrophe. The reason I say we can argue whether these are consonant clusters or not is that W at the end of a syllable and Y at the end of a syllable take on a vowel property. So the W sounds like OO at the end of a syllable and the Y sounds like E at the end of a syllable. Um, and so uh, they sound more like vowels. Just like in English, we have the saying, um, the vowels are A, I, O, U, and sometimes Y. So in Klingon, we can say the vowels are A, E, I, O, U, and sometimes W, and sometimes Y. And so uh, adding the glottal stop, the extra consonant after them, we could argue, uh, is the W acting like a vowel? And this is really C, V, V, W. Uh, is uh, C V V C, or is the W acting like a consonant? This really C V C C, but these are the only three consonant clusters that exist. So I don't think it's worth arguing about. Let's just call them all consonant clusters. Does that answer your question? <laughs> Answers your yeah, question. Yeah, thank you. That was quite thorough. <laughs> Any other questions? We got more time. I got nowhere to go. I just wanted to make the comment that as soon as you started speaking Klingon, I was like, ah, yep, he did contribute to, uh... <laughs> you recognize my voice. Instantly. I didn't recognize it until you spoke Klingon, because you had said that. I figured, oh, you, contribu you contributed, so you probably, like, helped them figure it out. And then I'm like, oh, no, he made the recordings. Okay, <laughs> I know this voice. <laughs> yeah, the, um... Uh... I uh, initially I did a lot of the recordings, which was not many. I was doing a lot of recordings on my own. I was moving real slow. Then we had Kov, who is one of the top Klingon speakers in the world, um, join in and help because we needed a female voice. And she was spending more time on it than I was. So we'll 
throughout the course, you'll find a lot of her voice, uh, a lot more than you'll find of my voice. Um, the system alternates between the male and female voices. And she's got a pretty deep voice, so sometimes she gets accused of being a male voice. But um, added a few more people to try and help us. So you are going to hear some other voices besides ours coming through now, too. Free to jump in with questions or comments. Uh, sure. And being a, um, sort of fascinated by how people describe time in Klingon, what are some strategies for newer Klingon speakers to deal with tenselessness, sort of how to construct the necessary context to indicate when in the past or in the future things are occurring? Especially if you don't have a specific time like last Tuesday, but more at some point in the past or at some point in the future that's maybe less specific? That's an excellent question. And actually, uh, I had said we're making some changes to the Duolingo course to try and improve some areas. And we're going to actually focus on that a little more uh, and earlier in the course. But, um, the So here's the thing. The way you set tense is through context. Um, and sometimes there can be a really, really complicated context. But the simplest way is to add a timestamp onto the beginning of the sentence. So the easiest time steps are things like yesterday, today, tomorrow, forever, always, sometimes. These are all timestamps that you can easily add to the beginning. And there's a bunch of what I would call adverbial timestamps words that you can put on like that. Although some of them are actually nouns, I think of them being used adverbially when they're a timestamp. Like today is a noun, but you can use it adverbially like a timestamp, or you can use it in a sentence as a noun. There's an interesting thing. It's just a quick little note, not important for you to know for sure, and mistakes are forgivable, but there's actually two words for today uh, Dach Jaj is the one that's used for timestamps mostly, though you will find it occasionally used out, outside of timestamps. And Jajvam is the word for today that's mostly used as the subject or object of a noun, such as in today is a good day to die. It's not saying on the today it is a good day to die. It's saying the today that we're at is a good day to die. And so you use Jajvam for that but dach jaj when you're setting a timestamp. Uh, so there's those single word timestamps that are adverbial or nouns or whatever. But then there's actually the most common way to set a time is to build a sentence that describes that timestamp and add the dit suffix or uh, pot suffix. We have these suffixes that give time references. Dit means when this happened, and then, so that's now your timestamp. <laughs> and then you can say the rest of the sentence. You can actually put them in either order. But uh, you can also do it with pot, which means before. Before this happened, um, and then that's your timestamp. Or you can say, uh, while this was happening, and then now that's your timestamp. So those are the ways to set timestamps when you when you need to set the tense. You can use one of those single word adverbial or noun timestamps, or you can create a timestamp using some of those verb suffixes. Interesting. Thanks. More questions or comments? I've run out of questions and comments, and I have run out of saliva. I need to go drink a gallon of water. <laughs> Thank you guys all for participating. Sorry I couldn't be there live to hear your pronunciation and, and spur you along with that, but I hope you enjoyed the presentation.